Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to Quail Ridge Church of Christ. If you are visiting with us, you're a welcome guest. If you would, fill out a visitor's card and leave that on the pew. It will be picked up later. Uh, if you would, at this time, silence your electronic devices or turn them off so they won't go off during the service. Our sick that we have listed, Glenn Fan, former minister at East Fraser, has stage four prostate cancer and is requesting prayers. Steve Elrod, glad to see Steve here, uh, having ongoing health issues, requesting our prayers. Elizabeth Lambert is at home sick with blood pressure problems. And uh, we have several at home not feeling well. Uh, so I think uh, maybe a little bit little COVID going on. Also, please remember our shut-ins, Tom and Joyce Stidham, David Marshall, Rwanda Slayton, Diana Shelby, Jim Hamm, Curtis Macklin, Elaine and Joe Sharon, Pat Swanson, Sue Simpson, and Nell Pewitt, and Bobby Stevenson. Uh, please remember to pray for all these and those who minister to their needs. Uh, please check your mailbox for mail. I know we've had uh, uh, several things from an administrative standpoint. We had to uh, put in the boxes for like tax, tax things and that sort of thing. So check your mailbox. The new heart to hearts are on the table in the foyer. Our monthly potluck will be Sunday, February 13th. That's in two weeks. After morning services, everyone plan on staying for the good food and fellowship. I have a card here from the Sharps to our spiritual family at Quail Ridge Church of Christ. Thank you so much for keeping our family in your prayers in the loss of a great sister-in-law and a brother who passed away very recently. Both were faithful Christians faithful children of God that we are thankful for. Thank you for the beautiful plant. We appreciate your kind thoughts and prayers. And that concludes our announcements. Let's be prepared to worship as we're led in singing. If you would turn your song books number 436. 436. After the song, we have rope in prayer. I've a home prepared where the saints abide, just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side, just over in the glory land. Just Oh, 
Almighty God in heaven, merciful and mighty art thou, Father, and we come before thee praising thy great and holy name. And for the thanks that we give, for the opportunity to worship, to be encouraged by one another, to be encouraged by your word, and to rejoice together over the salvation that's ours through the gift of your Son, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. We give thanks, Father, for the elders here who shepherd the flock, for our deacons who work here in the congregation, for Brother Willis and his ability to preach your word, for every member that's here that encourages us and shares the love of Christ. We're thankful, Father, for the food and shelter and the ways that you bless us every day, Father. We know that all the good things come from thee. We're thankful for the measure of health that we enjoy and the progress of those who have been ill and pray that you continue to be with those that were named today to be with Steve and Elizabeth, with Glenn Fan and our sick and shut-ins, Father, and others that are on our hearts and minds. Pray for those that they would be healed. We pray for those, Father, who have lost loved ones and the sense of loss that they feel, and especially this time for the Sharp family and others who have recently lost loved ones, Father. Pray for those who struggle spiritually, that they would find the strength in your word to overcome the troubles of this life, that they would find the source of strength, spiritual growth, and the understanding of the scriptures. Help us all, Father, as we study the scriptures to be more understanding and to grow spiritually and in our service to thee. Help us to have boldness and courage to stand for the truth every day that we live in a, in a world that increasingly wants to push away uh, spiritual matters. Have us, let us have a heart of compassion for one another, for, for those who haven't named the gospel of Christ, even for those who are enemies of Christ, Father. Help us have a heart of compassion to, to do what we can to continue to expose the world to the truth of the gospel. Help us to have a mind to work in your kingdom, Father, and a will to overcome temptations and strength to endure and wisdom to always do what's right. And we pray that as we worship you this morning that everything we do will be in the course of thy will. Forget our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. our minds for the Lord's Supper. Let's sing the first three verses of number 86. 86. I gave my life for thee. I can 
God, thank you so much for this bread and this represents the Christians, the body of Christ. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross so we might have forgiveness of our sins. Pray in Jesus' own name. Dear God, thank you so much for this fruit and vine, which to us represents the love of Christ, which flowed from his side as he hung on the cross, so that we might have forgiveness of our sins. Bless it to our daughters, and bless us to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Prepare to get back this morning. Let's sing the fourth verse, fourth verse number 86. <clears throat> and I have brought to thee God, we're so grateful for the privilege we have of living in such a great country that we have opportunities to make a livelihood. And we pray, Father, as we give back to you a portion of that we've earned, that we'll do so with a cheerful heart. The funds might be used to further your cause here on earth. In Jesus' holy name we pray.
you would go ahead and mark in your song books number 109, 109. This will be the song after the lesson of the hour. Before the lesson, let's sing number 286. 286. Ms. Convenient, please stand. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the light of Christ, sinless I see, he the great example is and pattern for me. Where he leads our fall. Good to see you this morning. We're glad that you're here. And we're certainly always thankful to be able to come together and worship God in spirit and in truth. If you have your Bibles, be turning it over to Genesis chapter 4. Wednesday night, we began looking uh, at some things concerning Adam and Eve. And we will continue to do some things uh, on that same subject this Wednesday night. We talked about faith several weeks ago, and we began looking at grace from the Old Testament perspective, and we will also look at it from the New Testament perspective. But continuing our thought on Adam and Eve, we come to a tragedy now, and it goes in line with sort of what we're talking about. We're looking at the subject matter of wake-up calls. But there are times where individuals do not wake up. There are times where individuals go on and do what they're going to do, regardless of the consequences. And that's kind of where we are with the subject this morning with Cain. Cain knew better, but he just didn't wake up. And we see tragedies like this, I'm afraid, far too often even today. If you follow programs like 2020 or Dateline, any of those programs that have such uh, stories as this, where it's brother against brother or parent or child against parent or parent against child, these things happen far too often, certainly in our country today. So it's not unusual, but how heartbreaking it is when we look at the circumstance surrounding this, knowing that Adam and Eve must have beat themselves up continually over understanding here's what we had and now look what we've done and so Cain 
committed several, at least two horrible crimes here. Number one, he changed God's worship to suit himself. Number two, which is the more notable one, I suppose, that we focus on oftentimes, he killed his brother Abel. Both of these are horrendous. When we look to the story of Cain and Abel, or we look to the story in Leviticus 10 of Nadab and Abihu, we are reminded the importance of doing what God commands us to do. Now, we know that we're not supposed to kill anybody. We know we're not supposed to murder anyone. But sometimes when it comes to the worship aspect, we have a world full of folks today that are doing what pleases them rather than what pleases God. So on one hand, we also have a world full of those that decide that they're going to worship according to what they want to do rather than what God desires. In the New Testament, we see that there are types of worships that are just simply not acceptable to God. There's vain worship. There is also certainly will worship. All of these are part of that idea of doing what I want to do, what makes me happy, rather than worshiping God in, in doing what he wants me to do. God's a spirit, John tells us, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, John 4 and verse 24. It's not a multiple choice. There's not an option. There's not a plan B. This is what has been the plan all along. So God's descriptive warning really springs to mind that sin is always right there at the door. It's there waiting to pounce in our lives. Whether it's something of this nature or whether it is something else, sin seems to always be waiting and crouching at our door. Whatever that sin may be, that sin that is left unforgiven, that sin that even grace does not cover, it's going to cause us to be eternally lost. It really doesn't matter what the sin is, does it? Whatever gets us to hell, it really doesn't matter what it was. We're there. And we're there for eternity. So I think it's important as we start talking about wake-up calls or lack thereof of those that didn't listen. I think it's a stern warning from Genesis to Revelation to every member of the body of Christ and those that are not members of the body of Christ that the time to wake up is now. The time to put off excuses is now. The time to worship God in spirit and in truth is now. Any other view or any other thoughts along that way is simply fooling ourselves in probably much the same way that Cain may have convinced himself and fooled himself that what he was doing was in line with the word of God. When we look at the sins of Cain, we see that they were both sins or crimes of self. In both cases, he wanted what he wanted the way he wanted. He wanted things his way. Sound familiar today? We're living in a very entitled world today. And I'm afraid it has crept into the church to where folks want what they want and they want it the way they want it, when they want it, rather than what God wants. And when that happens, we find God's way being pushed aside. No real interest, no real concern of whether or not we're doing it the way God wants us to do it. And I've heard folks say, and you have as well, well, this is the way I like to do it. This is the way I enjoy it. This is what I want. When it comes to worship to God, we see clearly there is a pattern, there is a plan, there is a way. The proverb writer even tells us there's a way that seems right, but the end thereof is death. So how do we decide? Well, we don't want to push God's way aside. Not only was God's way pushed aside in worship, but God's way was pushed aside with Cain's brother Abel. When we look at Cain's sin, 
and we look at his attitude. Again, I believe we see the same attitude today. And it can become quite frightening when you consider this attitude. <clears throat> we need to learn from the sin of Cain so that we don't repeat. And that's really the thing with history altogether. We have a lot of folks today that are trying to erase history, eradicate what has happened, eradicate history. And when we do that, whether it's biblical history or secular history, there's that tendency to forget. And when we forget, we tend to do some of these same things over and over again because we have nothing that we are reminded of, of just how ugly and how wrong something may have been. So getting rid of history for whatever reason one may think is a good idea is not a good idea. And it's certainly not a good idea when it comes to the spiritual thing. Number one, Cain's problem was self. And, I, and I've said it, sometimes I get in my own way. Sometimes I become my own worst enemy. Sometimes if I would just get out of the way and let God do what God is willing to do, things would be a whole lot different. You know, it's just not by accident that in Revelation, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. Folks who just get out of their own way sometimes and, and allow Jesus to come in. Allow Jesus to suck with them. Allow Jesus to be part of their life. Allow Jesus to rule and to be the Savior of their life. I guess another way you could put this is the word rebellion. Rebellion. Again, I don't want to do what I'm told to do. And we found a, 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 out about a lot of that Certainly in the last few years, haven't we? People say, well, I'm not doing it because you're telling me I've got to do something. Whether it was masks, whether it was vaccinations, whatever it may have been, people have a tendency to kind of get a little upset when it comes to the idea, you're not going to tell me what to do. And that comes into play spiritually too. People say, well, nobody's going to tell me how I'm supposed to live or, or what I'm supposed to do or what I can't do and, and on and on it goes and the end result isn't very pretty, is it? When it came to relationship with his brother, the problem with Cain and Abel, when it came to relationship, Abel, or, or rather Cain, had to be number one. He had to be number one. We all know individuals, and I hope we're not one of those individuals, that it's all about us. It's all about us. That's the way it was with Cain. It was all about him, what he wanted. He didn't want to go out of the way when it came, we're going to see the worship or, or uh, sacrifices or whatever it may have been. Nothing that would cause him to have to go above and beyond, if you will. When we look and we see here in Genesis chapter 4, he begins there, or we begin looking at our context here in in verse 1, <clears throat> where it says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought uh, of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain... And to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and uh, unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain uh, talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now uh, art thou cursed from the earth, 
which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from the uh, face uh, shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him. Sevenfold, the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So when you look at this and you began to see how all of this play out, it's very clear, and I think we can state it very plainly, the great obvious negative lessons from this text. Uh, it's a sin to put yourself before God. And it's a sin to put self before one's brother. Now, we probably have figured the thing out about God, but maybe we're still a little shaky on the brother part of it. And even when Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment, you remember when he talked about the love for God, number one, and the love for others, number two. But again, sometimes we allow self to get in our way. We can't put ourselves before our brother or our neighbor or before God. We see the example certainly clearly in the Bible. Uh, the case of Saul in 1 Samuel 15, the case of David in 2 Samuel 11. When you look at Cain's solution was love. Maybe not the kind we would think. Do you recognize the pattern of the Lord's teaching when you look at Matthew chapter 22? Uh, what we were just talking about when it comes to love. Matthew chapter 22 beginning with uh, verse 36. There again, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said... Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second, like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus said, this is what it's all about. If you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to be obedient to me, this is where the rubber meets the road, folks. If you only had time to say just a couple of things or one thing to someone, about what it is they need to do, this is it. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. Because when those two things are an active part of who you are, then Christ is an active part of who you are. And as I mentioned this morning, I saw a meme this week that I really like. And, and, and it's important that folks see Christ in us. Many people hate us. Because of Jesus Christ. But we don't want people to hate Jesus Christ because of us. We want to make sure that people see the light. That they see the truth. That they recognize not only in our words but in our actions. Who Christ is. Loving God, loving our neighbor. That's what's supposed to be there. Looking at the positive. Jesus says all the law and the prophets hang on these commandments. If Cain had loved God with all his heart. He never would have made the offering he did. Oh maybe his solution was love. Uh, and maybe he loved in the way that he wanted to love. A lot of people think they understand the term love. But Cain didn't love the way that he was supposed to. He didn't love God. And he sure didn't love his brother. How do we know that? By the fruit that he bore. By an action that was taken. And people can see the same thing in us. We can say one thing and then we go from this building, we go from this place on Sunday, and we do things that are contrary to the will of God throughout the week. People say, wow, and that person calls himself a Christian? If Cain had loved his neighbor and he'd loved God the way he should, 
he certainly wouldn't have done the things that he did. The third thing that we see, and the final thing there that we see really is, Cain's solution is our solution. When we talk about not waking up, it, it, it wasn't that Cain didn't know better. You know, sometimes we read the text there in Genesis and we say, well, maybe he wasn't aware of what he was to offer or what he was to do. Make no mistake, God's not condemning someone for doing something that they didn't know any better. He's not condemning anyone for doing something when they didn't know that it was wrong. So Cain is being condemned by God. He knew exactly what he was doing. He certainly knew when it came to killing his brother. But he also knew when he offered the fruit rather than the animal sacrifice. He knew what was commanded of him. And yet again, he decided to take the easy way and do what he wanted to do. His rebellion really manifested in his, in his worship. And I, I'm afraid that rebellion can manifest itself in worship for many today. Because there are many today that just do not see the importance of worship. They like to do it the way they like to do it. They like the ease and the comforts of what they want. Of what makes them comfortable. Rather than the things that make God pleased with us. Sometimes it may happen by putting those things ahead of worship. Recreation has oftentimes been what we look at that folks will sometimes put ahead of worship. Sometimes folks say, well, you know, I, I, I go up the bill, but I just really don't get anything out of it. Well, the obvious question then is, exactly what do you put into it? Surely we understand the concept in life, we generally get out of things what we put into things. If you come into a worship service and say, well, I don't, just don't get anything out of the song service, I don't get anything out of preaching, I don't get anything out of any aspect of the worship service, the question is, are you putting anything into it? Because if you're not putting anything into it, I guarantee you, you're not going to get anything out of it. Loving God with our whole heart will manifest itself when we seek to know what pleased God and then do it. We can know what pleases God. Each step of the way here, we're going to see what's pleasing. Cain knew what was pleasing to God. Abel knew what was pleasing to God. You and I know what's pleasing to God. Those that are listening this morning online know what's pleasing to God. The question becomes, are we willing to do those things that are pleasing to God or continue to buy in and believe our own excuses that, well, one way is as good as, as another? It's almost like saying, well, one religion is as good as another. So what is our attitude? So many uh, find new innovations in worship. They take denominational names, talk about modern day prophecies. Can you imagine if folks really were hungry for the Word of God and enjoyed worship and enjoyed singing and praying and doing the things that we do when we come together. Can you imagine? Many of us lived through a time to where we saw folks that were really hungry and enjoyed getting together and being a part of worship, Bible studies, gospel meetings, whatever took place. When the doors were open, that's what happened. That's where we would be. There was no shortage of volunteers. There was no shortage of evangelistic efforts in reaching out, setting up Bible studies. Cain's rebellion really manifested itself not only with the worship, but also with his brother. And it happens today. We may not kill our brother or sister, but our attitude toward our brother and sister can certainly be along the same line. You remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, if you've got that hatred in your heart, you've already killed that brother or sister. If you have that lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. 
So on and on, we see how important the heart plays a part in who we are and how important Christ is. I don't imagine anyone here, I hope, ever murders his brother in order to put yourself first. But there's subtle ways that we can do this. We can smear a, a brother or sister's good name. We can discourage them. We can exclude them from fellowship. Ignore them when they're in need. Take advantage of their good nature. Laugh at their expense. Steal from them. Sleep with their wife or husband. Lead them away from God. There's just so many ways that the end result is exactly the same. There's no doubt that we can be just as sinful as Cain. There's no doubt that we can be just as lost as Cain. Loving neighbor itself will manifest itself when we treat others the way we want to be treated. We call it the golden rule that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 7, 12, to do unto others as they would do unto you, not doing unto others before they do it unto you. It's a very high standard. But it's the only rule that will counter the sin that was brought about by Cain on his brother. And it's the only one that will counter the sin that will be brought about on our brothers and sisters as we are together one with another. When we follow this golden rule, There'll be no stealing or lying or adultery or backbiting and certainly no murder. But we'll be obedient to God in everything that we do. We'll love our neighbor and we'll want what's best for those around us. Those that are in Christ, those that are not in Christ. We'll still want the best for them. We want to show Christ to them through us. Remember, sin is crouching at the door. Remember those words. That's what we find with Cain and Abel. Cain would not wake up. He knew better, but again, he just wouldn't do better. And we see the end result. When we think of this account of the sin of Cain, it's real easy to say, well, whew, there's one thing that doesn't apply to me. Be careful. It's kind of like the sin of idolatry. Well, we don't have the golden cows and the idols today. Be careful. Be careful. Everything that we have within these 66 books apply to us today in one way or the other. And as Paul said in Romans 15, 4, we better learn from those things written aforetime. They're there for our learning. They're there for a reason. God just didn't haphazardly supply things and say, well, you may need this or you may not need that. We need it all. We better abide by what we have. I hope we've learned the lesson of loving God and certainly doing that with all of our heart because if we have, it will certainly show in our worship. For those that are here and for those that are online, if there are things amiss in your life, if, if it's becoming a child of God, today's the day you need to do that. Be buried in the water of baptism for the remission of sin. But if it's coming home, today's the day you need to do that as well. What a beautiful Lord's Day it is. If we can assist you in any way in getting your life where it needs to be, won't you come while we stand and sing? <coughs> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go
closing song this morning will be number 616. 616. We'll sing the first verse and have our closing prayer. I'm satisfied with just a country Lord, a little silver and a little gold, but in that city where the ranks will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop, in that bright land where we'll never grow, and someday Thank <clears throat> you. 